Good morning and good afternoon. Buenos dias. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Senior Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project, and I welcome you to Direct Relief Education Series, a bi-monthly series on a variety of topics for the primary care provider. Today launches our sixth session in this series, Speak My Culture, Natural Healers and Culture-Bound Syndromes in the Latino Community. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tamara Rios. CEO of Rios Associates, Dr. Rios was raised in both Acapulco, Guerrero, Mexico, and Tucson, Arizona. She's bilingual and bicultural and holds a BA and an MS in psychology with a minor in Spanish, as well as a PhD in psychology and education. She has been teaching and coordinating programs with Rios Associates since 2000. Dr. Rios has served as a consultant to various hospitals and medical groups for over 15 years. In addition, she has collaborated with and served as a consultant to a number of international hospitals and medical groups in Mexico, Spain, and Peru. Um, it has been my pleasure and our pleasure for Maven Project to partner with Direct Relief, and I'd like to briefly tell you about the two organizations. Maven Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and medical education sessions. And we encourage you, if your clinic is not a partner of Maven Project, to please reach out to us. Um, and we would love to learn about the needs of your clinic and how we can support you. Direct Relief is a nonprofit humanitarian medical assistance organization founded in 1948. Direct Relief supports the needs of healthcare providers and their patients worldwide. They ship medicines and medical supplies to over 100 countries and all 50 U.S. states. In the United States, Direct Relief supports about 1,600 health centers, free and charitable clinics, and other safety net providers. In addition to this material support, Direct Relief provides cash funding in the form of grants and awards. And also, if you are not yet partnered with Direct Relief, you can find out more information on their website. Um, please mark your calendars for the following Direct Relief sponsored um, and partnered talks that are coming up. So on Friday, this Friday, August 19th, that's tomorrow, we have Time Management and Preventing Burnout with Dr. Fred Kleinsinger. On Friday, September 2nd, we have a talk on psoriasis with Dr. Jeanette Okoye. That's our through our Vaseline Healing Project. And on Friday, October 14th, um, Pharmacological Treatment of Anxiety Disorders with Dr. Judy and Smith. And all of these talks are at 10 a.m. Pacific time, um, which is one o'clock Eastern time. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Rios. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jill Einstein, buenos dias, good morning. And I know for some of you, it's already afternoon. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Thank you all for joining in on today's session. I am going to share my screen. So bear with me here a moment. So today I wanted to speak a little bit about the natural healers and culture bound syndromes in the Latino community. Uh, before we get started, I really want to thank everyone for all of the hard work that you're doing in general with your patients, but especially with your Latino patients. So that said, I thought I would share a little bit about the Latino community in terms of our beliefs uh, when it comes to natural healers, culture bound syndromes. But it's important to be mindful that there are various groups of, of Latinos, obviously. So my intention is not to generalize, but I would really like to emphasize that this particular course, this presentation, presentation is geared towards Latinos, those of us that are born and raised in Latin America, who have come to the US later in life. And those of us that maybe have the more traditional indigenous uh, background. So again, not all Latinos are going to be running over to their natural healers for help or believing in the culture bound syndromes, but many of us really, really do. So for those of us that have those beliefs, I just wanna share some insight and a little bit of background as to what that's all about. So, 
please keep in mind there are 20 Spanish speaking countries plus the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. So that said, although we do speak the same language, Spanish and share the same culture, obviously there will be differences, even regional differences within the same country. So I really like to highlight and emphasize that. Uh, you will find some of those differences as you work with your different Latino patients. Now, I wanna take us into a little bit of background just before we get started with your Latino patient, because I feel like if you have a little bit of understanding with where we're coming from, from, uh, I think that'll help build that rapport and that trust that's so important. So a couple of points here. Number one, I think anyone that works with the Latino community knows how important family is. Family is number one, and they're oftentimes very much involved in major life decisions. One of those being anything related to healthcare. So it's not necessarily this individual independent decision that we make as the patient. We will consult with our family and gather around and really listen uh, to our family members when it comes to that because they, we know that they have our best interest in mind. That said, in the Latino culture, we do not distinguish between immediate and extended family. Everyone is family. So that's a, there's a lot of people involved in our decision-making processes. So I like to point that out because oftentimes there's at least one, if not the entire family that's chiming in with, oh, you should go see the natural healer, which again, in Spanish, we wouldn't necessarily refer to it that way, but for example, el curandero, santero, yerbero, and we'll be discussing that in a moment. So keep in mind that we're having that recommendation come pretty strongly from our loved ones. So definitely worth inquiring about, oh, what is your family? Family think about this as you're interacting and communicating with your Latino patient. Now you might notice, and again, certainly don't mean to generalize, but many of us Latinos, such as myself, do tend to be a little bit more animated, a little bit more expressive with our feelings. And for some, it might come across as, oh my goodness, it seems a bit exaggerated, almost like a soap opera, a telenovela, which actually for many of us is quite normal life. Uh, it's just the way we happen to express ourselves. Now, it's really important to note that there's also the other end of the spectrum where many of us Latinos, for, if we're from a more indigenous community, we might actually be much more reserved and stoic. And in fact, you might not be able to determine, well, are they in pain? Are they happy? Are they sad? I really can't tell. And many times we avoid eye contact. And again, that's actually out of respect because we do consider you an authority figure and we would never mean to challenge you with that direct look. So those are just some small uh, differences that you'll notice even within the Latino community. Now, we are a little bit more accustomed to physical contact. So within your comfort zone, if you wouldn't mind, you know, even the handshake or the tap or leaning in, I know right now we might need to be a little bit more cautious uh, with that. So even if it's just leaning in, body language is so important in the Latino community and especially tone of voice. If you can welcome us with that warm, upbeat voice, it just, Puts, it, it puts us at ease. Now, one thing I did want to point out is in a good part of the Latino culture, and again, with the more indigenous influence, you might notice that some of us uh, don't necessarily ask a lot of questions. And when you are done giving us your spiel, uh, oftentimes I know you'll ask, oh, do you have any questions? Or does that make sense? Many times we just politely agree. Like, oh, no, no tengo preguntas, I don't have any questions, or you would ask if we understand, oh, si, si, si. Now, you might notice some of us, if we're from certain areas, say Cuba, si, la República Dominicana, we do tend to be a little bit more assertive and might uh, actually go forward and just ask some very point and direct questions. Uh, but again, not everyone, just depends where we're from. So the reason why I point this out is please encourage us to ask questions. So rather than the, oh, do you have any questions? Really get into, I would really love if you ask me any questions. If there's anything I can clarify, that's what I'm here for. So please, please, if you don't have any questions now, think about it and then the next visit, 
feel free to, to reach out to me with those questions. So if you can spend a little bit more time encouraging us, I think that would be worth it. A uh, couple of other things here before we move along is many of us have the, the belief that illnesses are related to that lack of balance in the body. So because of that imbalance, naturally many of us will automatically want to seek our curanderos, our santeros, our yerberos, our sobadores, all of the natural healers. So something to keep in mind. So you might want to even ask about that uh, when you're working with your, your Latino patients. We do tend to gravitate more towards the natural remedies, the home remedies. We tend to like to take a lot of hierbas, herbs, which you might see here. Uh, we will go to the yerberias, which are the herbal stores. Depending which country we're from in Latin America, you might see it spelled out either of these two ways. When we go to the yerberias, we oftentimes will ask to speak to the yerbero or the yerbera, which is the herbalist or the specialist in herbs. And oftentimes they will share with us what we need to take based on the symptoms that we share with them. And we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, although we know that medicines in the pill form or the, the syrup form are effective, we really do have a preference towards more of the natural uh, methods. And you might notice, especially with the kiddos, we're always asking for the magical vitaminas, vitamins. So anyway, that's just a little bit of background about your typical traditional Latino patient. So let's move on to the healthcare provider, you. So here's some tips to really help build on that rapport and that trust, because once you achieve that, then we as Latino patients will feel so much more comfortable opening up to you about what we think we have, such as those culture bound syndromes, if we're seeing the natural healers, because Otherwise, if we don't really have that trust with you, we will feel a little bit leery, a little bit uncomfortable sharing and divulging this information because many of us might feel like, gosh, I don't know how they're gonna respond. Will they think it's hocus pocus? Are they going to frown or look down on me? So many times we prefer to just keep quiet. So if you can really start to use some of these tips, it's gonna help build that trust and rapport and therefore will ease our stressors and make us feel more comfortable to be truthful and just open up with you about that. So let's take a look. I talked about the body language. So again, physical contact is important. The shaking of the hands, if we want to be a little bit more cautious, obviously, during these times, maybe the wave, or again, like I said, placing your, your hands to your heart when you're introducing yourself, the mucho gusto, nice to meet you. Body language again matters, tone of voice. What doesn't work as well with Latinos is that more serious uh, monotone tone, tone of voice because that makes us a little nervous. It's like, oh gosh, they're not welcoming us into this warm, caring environment. So again, within your comfort zone. I know many of you might think, gosh, you have so many names and surnames. How do I even refer to my patient or how do I pronounce the name? Don't be shy. Ask us because it shows interest. I know I always love it when people ask me, is it Tamara, Tamara, Tamara? Uh, and I was, oh, it's Tamara. It's one of the things I always kind of chuckle at is if I'm getting coffee and I give them my name and they, oh, you mean Tamara. Okay. But it's always nice to get that question asked. So don't be shy. Now, even if you just know one word in Spanish, say it. A little bit goes a long way. So if it's hola, hello, good morning, buenos dias, soy, I am, you can introduce yourself that way. Gracias, thank you, por favor, please. Any of those, if you can sprinkle those throughout the visit, it really signals to us that you care and you're really trying. Always ask about the family. Usually the family is there, so that'll be quite easy. And of course, thanking the family members for joining in and supporting their loved one in that uh, treatment, care, visit, and so forth. Always show interest. So this is going to be key when we're talking about the culture bound syndromes and the natural healers. So if you come in with a little bit of an open mind and just show some interest, curiosity, oh, I would love to hear more about that. Please tell me more. And that way we'll feel much more comfortable uh, to share that with you. Now, uh, the natural healers, we highly regard, just like we highly regard you healthcare providers, there is one particular person in the family that we also highly regard, and that is la abuelita, grandma, or abuela, grandmother. So that said, she's a very important uh, figure in the family. We all will refer to her when we have our medical issues or concerns. Uh, grandma, what do you think about this? Because again, she's had a life long 
just experience of what to do. And oftentimes she might even be the curandera. She might actually be the sobadora. So again, it's something to keep in mind and maybe even ask about when you're working with your patient. Who uh, is helping out? Has anyone in your family shared anything? What about abuelita? What about grandma? So great way to really get that conversation going. I would also recommend perhaps not going against what abuelita is saying. So there's a way, again, you don't necessarily have to agree, but maybe a nice way to approach this is to thank your Latino patient. That's wonderful, really. I want to thank you for taking the time to really explore all options uh, with your abuelita, with some of the natural healers. Thank you for sharing that with me. You know, what we've actually discovered is, and then you can fill in the blank and maybe in an indirect way, kind of guide us towards where you would like. So. I feel like that method will help prevent any potential uh, concerns that might come up with the Latino patient if you by chance do say something like, oh no, that's actually not the case. Or that's not, we found that that's not correct. That right there might cause some potential problems with your Latino patient. So again, welcome everything, but maybe redirect us in a very polite, courteous manner. So let's take a look at the culture belt and syndromes. I'm going to highlight them and then I'll share some additional slides. There is one, however, nervios that I'll spend a little bit more time with uh, on this particular slide. But let's take a look. So culture bound syndromes. Uh, culture bound syndromes is an easy way to just explain this, at least the way I like to, is to say, look, if it's something in one's home country that technically can be diagnosed and treated, it will then be a culture bound syndrome. And this is not just specific to the Latino culture. You will find this throughout the world in different countries. In fact, the DSM-5 has several of these culture bound syndromes, one of which is actually ataque de nervios or also just known as nervios. So if you're ever curious, feel free to, to Google some of those or you can, if you happen to have a DSM-5, you can take a peek and, and look a little further there. But let's take a look at each one, caída de mollera which is very similar to the sunken fontanelle. So you might notice sometimes mom or abuelita or dad or a tia, aunt is coming in and constantly touching and feeling the baby's head because it feels soft. It just doesn't feel perfect and right. We might not necessarily know what's going on, but there's that concern. So many times we are just very, very concerned and we'll take our baby in because of that. And I do wanna point out that some of the reasons as to why that might occur can be, again, similar to here in the US, dehydration, which is actually gonna be a bonus because if we hear that, we'll be very eager to take and give our, our babies the suero, which is Pedialyte in Spanish. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But I do also wanna share when we get to that, some of the other things that we do uh, in our culture to help uh, remedy that. Uh, nervios, and don't worry, I'll be going into all of these in more detail. Nervios, I'd like to spend a little bit more time with here uh, because it is something that you're going to see a lot. And I know a lot of people have already seen it. A lot of people have questions about it. It is indeed quite similar to to what here in the US we would refer to as a panic attack. It's very common in Latina women. You tend to see it a little bit more. And I like to just break it down and, and give a little bit of background here. In the Latino culture, the traditional Latino culture, it's very common for the woman to self-sacrifice, meaning to put their significant other first, put the children first, then put their parents, then their in-laws. Remember, we don't distinguish between immediate and extended family. So then we have to put all the other family members first. So there's rarely any time for oneself as a woman. When that does occur, it just so happens to be with you, the healthcare provider. It's almost overwhelming. It's like, oh my gosh, I did, this is about me. And it might just all come out and be that moment where I just need to, what we say in Spanish, desahogarme, see, to let it all out. So it can be quite jarring for someone that's not accustomed to that. It is a lot, it could be a lot of crying. It could be yelling and screaming and just someone who's visibly upset and expressing all of those frustrations and stresses and anxiety. Uh, so my suggestion, again, a couple things, is let us have that moment, see? And I, I think this is a good opportunity to also share with your 
patient that there is someone that we can talk to about this. So this might be an opportunity to talk about the therapeuta, the therapist. I know sometimes in the US we have a little bit more of the Spanglish term of therapist, therapista, uh, but in a good part of Latin America, if you're curious, we do tend to use the term therapeuta. Uh, consejero, consejera, counselor is oftentimes used. It seems to be less threatening because in our culture it is considered a little bit taboo still to talk about anything related to mental health. So that said, really encourage us and maybe present it in a general way. You know, I have, I would love to refer you to a specialist where you can talk about this in more detail and really share some of your experiences and feelings and thoughts. So when you present it that way, it doesn't sound threatening. Like, well, I'm going to refer you to a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a therapist. That right there might be a bit of a trigger and we might politely say, oh, see, sí, see, sí, doctor, but not necessarily follow through. So I, I, I'd love to recommend just potentially sharing it, delivering that message in a more less th stressful way for us. So that is a little bit about nervios. I want to go into mal de ojo, which I'm sure many of you recognize as the evil eye, which actually exists in a lot of different countries throughout the world and a lot of different cultures. The evil, I mean, think of Greece. You might notice those little blue eyes, the amulets to help ward off that evil eye. Well, in many parts of Latin America, we also have that. And the thoughts, again, and the ideas behind it do vary depending where we're from in Latin America uh, and the region and the country, whether there's more of an indigenous influence or more of the Spanish influence. Because remember that the Latino culture has a lot of the Spanish influence when they came in and conquered Latin America. We do also have a lot of the Catholic religion influence. So you'll see a lot of this when we get into uh, a little bit more of how we can protect with some of these amulets against, for example, the evil eye, mal de ojo. You're going to see a mixture of the Catholic religion with indigenous beliefs, uh, also a lot of the African gods for the parts of the Caribbean Spanish-speaking islands that we pray to. So anyways, I'll get into that in a moment. I'll just get so excited and want to share it all at once, but I do want to point that out. So different areas might be slightly different, but let's talk about the evil eye. There's the idea that it could be intentional or unintentional, and it is particularly common in children. Uh, again, it could be babies. So an example, it could be where, gosh, here's this beautiful, healthy baby, and I've been trying to get pregnant all this time. And I just haven't. So that could be an unresolved issue that I have that can then transfer on, and the baby might get a little fussy, what we would consider that way here in the US, crying, fussy, uh, just upset, maybe getting a little red, all of that can signal the mal de ojo. But it can also happen in older children, it can happen in adults, and we'll get into a little bit more of the specifics in a moment, but I just wanted to highlight the basics there. And we do obviously have amulets, pieces of jewelry, uh, a variety of figurines to help protect against that, which I will share with you in a moment. But let's move on to malaire for a moment. And many of you might recognize that thanks to Latin, there's a similarity, right? Uh, in a lot of the words, so aire, you can see air there, mal is bad. So really literally bad air. So there's the idea that any exposure to cold air or nighttime air can cause a cold, it can cause an illness, it can cause a symptom, a disease. So if you ever think back to, I don't know, maybe your mom or grandma or great grandma, oh, don't go out with wet hair or put on a sweater so you don't catch a cold. Well, that's pretty much the idea with us. So you don't want to go out without a sweater because you can get sick. You don't want to go out with wet hair because you can also get sick. There's other parts of malaire that exist uh, that are worth noting. So there's the idea that oh, I'm going to catch a cold with the change of climate. So it's really hot for many of us that are from really very hot areas. I'm from Acapulco, Guerrero. There is no winter. It's literally like 90 degrees year round. It's hot and humid. So you're used to just walking around and drenched in, in sweat and perspiration. Then you walk in to an ice box. So that change can cause a cold. So there's a lot of idea behind that. Also, if you just ironed a shirt and you put it on and walk into a cold uh, AC setting, you can catch a cold or it can cause back aches. So that's a little bit about how that 
that works. And again, we'll dive into more detail in a moment. Susto is the other one. So susto, you might recognize for those of you that speak Spanish and a little bit of, a little bit of Spanish, asustar. Asustar is to scare. Uh, so think of it as a, a scare. And as you can see, quite similar to what in the US we would refer to as PTSD. So susto can be a scare, a fear that can occur. It can be a trauma, if you will, but all on the spectrum because it can be something that perhaps is not so traumatic or something that is very traumatic. An example, maybe, I don't know, when I was eight years old, I was riding on my bicycle and I fell over and had an accident and I injured my leg. Maybe it was just a simple injury and it recovered, or maybe I fractured uh, a bone. So it could be immediately later. Well, that was the susto. And it could be days later or years later, my leg hurts. Well, it was because of the fall 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So we tend to have that idea. Now, it can also be much, much more traumatic, especially for those of us Latinos that are coming uh, from warlike settings. Many parts of Central America, there's so many of us Latinos fleeing those warlike settings, the violence, the sexual violence. So something much more traumatic, like a, a sexual aggression, it could be a rape, it could be seeing your family members murdered, very, very traumatic experiences. So that also will fall under the uh, term of susto. Once again, uh, referring to, uh, to our psychologist, psychiatrist, but perhaps not necessarily directly stating psychologist, psychiatrist, maybe just the specialist, so that that is well received from us and not so threatening sounding. Last one I wanted to highlight here, empacho, and that's pretty similar to just an upset stomach. Any GI issue, especially in children, we tend to call empacho. It could be eating too much candy. It can be just having a general upset stomach, and, and we'll take a look at the details of that later. So let's move along. I want to go back to Sunken Fontanelle. I'm just going to spend a little bit more time with each one. So again, we talked about the idea, right, that soft spot. It's one of the many reasons, dehydration, but I want to share with you some of our perspective. So in the more indigenous uh, Latino communities, there's the idea that by stopping the breastfeeding or the bottle feeding too abruptly, too quickly can cause that. It can also be by holding or carrying the baby incorrectly, or if the baby fell or was shaken, those are all major concerns for us that we would think, oh, well, it was caused because of that. Now, there are two very common remedies, if you will, that we use, none of which are obviously ideal and are actually quite concerning when you hear them, but I do want to be honest and, and truthful. This is what many of your very traditional indigenous Latinos might be doing if, in that event. So uh, taking your thumb and pushing up on the paladar, the palate of the baby with the idea that it will kind of pop back into place, if you will, or the other one, which again is, I hate to say it's worse, is we take the babies and we hold them upside down by the ankles and tap the feet with hopes that it'll fall back into place. Once again, neither are recommended, and I am not by any means encouraging this. I just want to share what is done in some areas. So that said, we might not necessarily share our concern, but if you see us constantly touching the baby's head, then this is an excellent opportunity to quickly act, act swiftly, and ask, well, what, what do you think is going on, or what are your thoughts? And you know what? This is a great opportunity, especially if we're from Mexico, that you can recommend Pedialyte. We're all for Pedialyte. Suero. I'm sure many of you have heard Suero. Suero, suero, that is your Pedialyte. And a side note, it also doesn't mean IV and IV fluid. So just in context, keep that in mind. We're very eager to give that to our babies or children. And oftentimes we do it without you even recommending it. So because that is one of the causes, I think that'll uh, work out well in terms of your many recommendations. So let's move along to the mal de ojo, the evil eye once again. I just want to get into some additional information. So this again, exist throughout the world. But within Latin America, there's some variations, right? So the whole idea is there's this bad energy or negative energy that was kind of transferred onto you, if you will, by someone else. Again, intentional or unintentional, which can therefore cause illnesses, sickness, uh, any type of problems, be it with money, with work, just in general, bad luck. So that said, we want to be able to protect against that, right? And we talked about before with the babies and the kiddos, it can be something like, oh, you know, I'm admiring this beautiful baby, but I 
can't get pregnant or something maybe a little bit more I don't know if you want to call it insignificant but gosh you know the little girl is better dressed than my daughter or she's uh better mannered or whatever it is we might have a little bit of envy and it can transfer on so again that's another cause of mal de ojo uh, i like to always point out that we always go see our natural healers for the evil eye for the limpia which is what we would refer to as the cleansing and that's a variety of different rituals based on who you see uh in terms of the curandero the santero the yerbero etc and we'll get into that in a moment but now i want to take us to a little bit more about how we can protect against the evil eye, right? And mal de ojo. And you'll see a few of the little amulets here. So some of us here that now we're in the US, you might notice we just might have a simple red string of a bracelet wrapped around our wrist. And the red color is what really wards off the evil eye. Many of us in Mexico and parts of Central America, you'll notice we use the ojo de venado, which is a deer's eye. Obviously, it's not a real deer's eye, but it's, it signals that. And that is what wards off the evil eye. And in addition to that, remember how I mentioned we have a lot of the Catholic influence? Well, you'll see it here. We can pick an image of someone in the Catholic religion. It could be La Virgen de Guadalupe. It can be a saint of our choice. It can be anyone. It could be Jesucristo. So you'll notice that we have that. Now, this particular image that you'll see has the red and black beads on there. Uh, so you might just see that without the deer's eye. Okay. Now, in parts of the Caribbean, it kind of depends where you're from, you might notice that we have the ojos eyes de Santa Lucia, St. Lucy's eyes, and that serves as, again, a protection. And you might see it on the lower image where it says milagros, there's a set of eyes. Uh, that's what it would look like. Now, I want to point out there's other things. We have escapularios. Again, a lot of this really gravitates more towards the Catholic religion. Even if we might not necessarily be Catholic per se, we still have these beliefs because it's so ingrained in our culture. So the escapulario is interesting because that is definitely much more of a Catholic influence. You might notice many of us will wear it as protection and it's almost uh, a way to just guarantee our way into to heaven. So for those of you that might do procedures or surgeries, you might notice your Latino patient gets very nervous about removing it, especially imagine during that you want that protection. So oftentimes a little recommendation if possible is maybe taping it uh, to the, another body part or maybe just having it near them for comfort. Uh, I want to address quickly milagros because this actually can be used outside of the evil eye, the mal de ojo. So milagros we oftentimes will use if we have a loved one who is sick and we will make a manda which is a promise to God to say, God, please, if you help my family member get better, I will give a sacrifice, a manda, see? Whether that be shaving off my long, thick, beautiful hair or walking on my knees to the farthest cathedral or church, whatever it is. If, I don't know, if I smoke, I will not smoke again. Whatever your desire is, you're willing to sacrifice that for the love of your family members. So what happens is we end up buying, purchasing the milagro, which can be in different body parts. You'll see here we have an arm, we have eyes, so it could be maybe uh, someone who injured their arm uh, or leg or eyesight anything you buy the body part in fact we even have some internal organs and as you can see here we even have some animals because for many of us we have farms and ranches and we depend on our animals we need them to get healthy so oftentimes we'll hang the milagro this little metal uh amulet and make that promise to god we'll do that in the church uh, or in our own little home and that's kind of the way that works so we really believe in that we have a lot of the uh, candles the tall candles as well that we're hoping to light and pray for for, for good energy for all of this, not just the evil eye. So I just wanted to share what some of those look like. Now let's talk about a the limpia a little bit, the cleansing. So I, I tried to add on some images as closely as I could to convey what that might look like. So here we have the president of Mexico, 
AMLO, who is actually receiving a limpia, right? So it cleans out all of that negativity, the bad energy, which could be the symptom, the illness, the disease, whatever that is. It is being cleaned out. And oftentimes it's by using sage and some other herbs. Okay, that really does depend on your curandero or the santero or the natural healer you're working with. Now, some don't even use herbs. Some might actually use an egg. Now, the egg is supposed to symbolize a pure, clean entity. So by rubbing or motioning the egg over the affected area, that will remove that negative energy, which again is considered to be the illness, the symptom, the disease. And each natural healer kind of has their own technique on how they do that. They might crack the egg in front of you in a glass and show you, see, look, it's gray, it's brown. I have now removed that negative energy from you. Or they might say, you know what, uh, take the egg and dig a hole in your backyard and put it there, or put it in a corner of your house. Again, each natural healer will have their own technique. Now, some of the natural healers will actually use a chicken. And again, it's the same concept. We'll motion that chicken over the affected body part. And again, with the same idea. Uh, so anyways, hopefully this gives a little bit of background about how a lot of these culture bound syndromes are treated. The main one here again being the mal de ojo, the evil eye. Now, malaire, malaire, this is actually the one, remember, with that cold air or going out into the nighttime air. And again, it can be something that after we were cooking, we were in that hot setting and then we go out into the cool air. Well, that's why I got sick. Por el mal aire, por mal aire, see the bad air. So again, it's essentially going back and forth from hot to cold, cold to hot. Now, rather than a lot of these amulets in terms of treatment, we actually use what's called ventosa in Spanish, and that is cupping in English, as you can see here. Uh, it's lighting a candle, right, with a suction glass and just suctioning that up. And that is also something that's practiced throughout the world, not just in Latin America, but it is uh, something very, very common to our culture as well, and especially uh, for the mal aire. Now, let's take a look at the susto, see, which again is similar to the PTSD. And again, the idea is it's caused by a frightening event or a traumatic event. It can be something that perhaps is not as traumatic and something that is extremely traumatic. So it really is worth talking about this in, in more detail, obviously in a very uh, sensitive uh, patient understanding manner. And this might be a good opportunity, once again, to refer to the especialista, the specialist, so that they can talk more about it uh, in detail. Now, one thing I wanted to point out with some of the treatments that you'll notice the natural healers in our community use, is again, a lot of the teas, the herbs, which is why I always encourage asking your patient when you ask your typical question of, do you take any medicines? Or are you taking any medicines? This is where you want to add on. Are you taking any medicines, herbs, teas, home remedies? vitaminas, vitamins, because chances are we are doing all of the above. So if you just ask us about medicines, we're probably only going to share medicines. We're not going to divulge all of the other things that we're doing. So please, please uh, add that on to your list of questions and you'll be surprised to see what some of your Latino patients actually will respond with. Now, that is one of the treatments, again, the teas and the herbs and so forth. The other one, which I know many might think, gosh, I don't know if that's really a good idea, but there's the concept that you can treat the susto with a lesser susto. So another type of scare or, or traumatic uh, experience, again, not something that is recommended, but happens, especially in the very traditional indigenous Latino cultures. So let's move on to the last one, which is empacho, pretty much boils down again to any upset stomach, those gastrointestinal problems. So again, it can be just eating a lot of candy, junk food for the kiddos, uh, eating at the wrong time of day. It could also be that, certain foods. Uh, again, a lot of us will have that belief of the hot and cold uh, with a lot of areas of our health. So keep that in mind as well. So this is now where your natural healer oftentimes uses the egg, right? And if I have any Latinos here, you might notice, especially if you're from Mexico and kind of that area, parts of Central America as well, you'll notice that we are famous for using the eggs, the curanderos. So again, one of the natural healers will take a look at momentarily. So that's pretty much the way the, um, 
uh, in Bacha Works. Now, I want to take you to the natural healers in Latin America. So there are many, there aren't many. The first one, the curandero. So this is a natural healer that combines the Catholic religion, right, with the indigenous beliefs. So there are a lot of home remedies. There are a lot of prayers and techniques that we use. The curanderos highly regarded in the Latino community that they're in. In fact, all of the natural healers are highly regarded. There is no official formal schooling per se, but it's something that's passed down through generation, perhaps through abuelita, uh, through grandfather, uh, through a neighbor. So that's pretty much how that works. So back to the curandero. Oftentimes the curanderos are the ones that use the eggs and the herbs. So that said, herbs are oftentimes used as treatment and usually it's to maybe steep in a tea form and you'll drink that. So for example, eh, te de manzanilla, which is your chamomile tea. We use that for so many things. Uh, te de tila, which I always struggle finding out the meaning. I think it's linden tea in English, but that one is excellent for anxiety, stress, insomnia. So at any rate, your curandero will let you know what type of herb or tea to use along with, again, the use of the egg, which is supposed to withdraw that negative energy. Now, uh, we oftentimes are praying to the, the saints or anyone that we really focus in on in terms of our preference, because in the Catholic religion, there's a lot of saints. We do also pray to the indigenous gods in the more traditional indigenous community within that curandero, a natural healer. Now, the santero, the santero, very similar to the curandero, but you might see a little bit more in the coastal areas and uh, also in Cuba, La República Dominicana, uh, etc. In that region, Puerto Rico, you'll see more of the espiritista. Uh, so what's interesting with that is you have more of the African influence. So just a little bit of background when it comes to history, you know, the Spaniards came in through Latin America, conquered us. A lot of the indigenous uh, groups became slaves and then they were murdered off and then there were no more slaves. So then the Spaniards brought in Africans as slaves. And that's where you get a lot of the influence uh, from the African gods. So rather than the indigenous gods and beliefs, you have more of the African gods with the santeros. Uh, oftentimes you'll see that the santeros also use eggs, but also a little bit more common, the chickens that we talked about before. Remember, it's the same. same thing, motioning the chicken over the area, the affected area, with the idea of it removing uh, that negativity, whether it be the illness, symptom, disease. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out, there are santeros that also use different techniques. It could be an actual Puro, which is a cigar, and they might smoke the cigar and kind of blow out that negative energy. As I mentioned, each natural healer has their own techniques. Each area and region in Latin America have their own little ways of treating it, but generally speaking, these are the tools that are used. Now, Espiritista, pretty much a combination of the above, a little bit more common in Puerto Rico, uh, in terms of how they're referred to. Now, shaman, again, very, very similar. You might even say, oh, well, gosh, that's almost the same. I think where it varies is the terms are a little bit different. So in many parts of South America, we actually would refer to curanderos as shaman. So again, it really depends on the region and where we're from. Because there's a very, very large indigenous community as well throughout South America, you are going to see a little bit more of that influence uh, there. So something to keep in mind. Now, the yerbero or the yerbera, because remember, this can be either male or female. And because the Spanish language, as most other Romance languages, are gendered, you need to switch the O to the A. So O for male, yerbero, and yerbera would be for a female, uh, yerbera. So a little Spanish uh, info there, if you're curious. Now, the yerbero de yerbera oftentimes is in a yerberia, as we talked about before, at the herbal store, the botanica, as many places are referred to as well uh, for the herbal location, the store. Now, the yerbas, the actual herbs, are being uh, given to by the yerbero. So usually this is what happens. Let's assume I go see the yerbero and I say, look, these are my problems. These are my symptoms. Based on that, he or she will prepare some herbs for me, either in a tea form that I can steep, 
It can also be mixed or blended into a certain cream so that I can apply on the affected area, or it can be used as a form of, uh, how do you say it in English, hacer inhalaciones, to do inhalations, like in a, a humidifier, a vaporizer, you can breathe that in. So those are the more common ways you'll tend to notice uh, how, we how we use the hierbas as treatment, but it's as directed from the yerbero or the yerbera. Now, the huesero. Some of you might recognize the term hueso, which means bone. And it is. It's almost like the bone fixer, the bone adjuster, if you will, similar to perhaps what we would refer to as a chiropractor here uh, in the US. So when we have some issues with our bones, we do tend to see the huesero or the huesera for the bone adjusting, if you will. Now, the last one that I really want to dive into more is the sobador, the sobadora. So for those of you that speak a little bit of Spanish or you just speak Spanish, it's your first language, sobador, sobadora. That is kind of like your massage slash physical therapist. So the verb sobar is to massage. And in some regions, you might hear the verb masajear. And I think a little bit more of the English influence, you'll notice that here, masajear, to massage. But uh, sobar is also to massage. So you can see where we're getting at with this. So I always like to point out, this is not a massage or, oh, my back hurts. It could indeed be that, but it can also be any other symptom. It could be anything. It could be insomnia. It can be anxiety, it can be a cold, it can be a stomach ache. You just let the sobadora, so the, the sobadora know this is what's bothering me. And then he or she will do a certain massage that will kind of blend pressure points with stretches and with cupping. So it's a combination. And the whole idea is it helps alleviate any of those symptoms that your Latino patient has. The sobadoras are highly, highly regarded. I can't tell you how many times I've gone back home to my hometown Acapulco. And anytime I have anything, my entire family's like, ay, Tamara, we have to go to the sobadora. And it's like the immediate, uh, just let's go. And what's interesting there is many of the natural healers will see you right away. There's not the, the wait of, oh, you know, you have to wait a few weeks or even in some locations, a few months. So I mention that because many of us Latinos tend to lean towards where we can be seen immediately. And it can be quite shocking and jarring to receive a, oh, you know, our next appointment is in two weeks or, you know, four weeks or three months. I know I had that happen once and I was really in shock, but understandably so. You guys are so, so busy uh, and treating so many patients. So th the reason why I mention this is we oftentimes will go see our natural healers because we can see them right away, because there's just this understood just point of the culture and the language. It doesn't require having to explain anything. It's just also natural. Oftentimes because Abuelita wants us to go or she is the curandera many times. So there's a lot of reasons as to why we go see our, our natural healers. Again, all, all very, very respected in the Latino community. Now, I want to share with you one last slide just to highlight a few more because these are probably the main natural healers you will hear about. So again, the, the curanderos. And as we talked about before, there's a lot of the indigenous influence. So in Mexico, when we're referring about the indigenous influence in parts of Central America, that includes the Aztecas, see the Aztecs and the see, and also the Inca. So you have a mix there. And just to highlight, those aren't the only indigenous groups. There are so many in each country in Latin America. So it would really take thousands of PowerPoint presentations to really dive into all of them in our 20 Spanish speaking countries in Puerto Rico Commonwealth. So just highlighting some of the main ones. Now the shamans, again, those are usually the healers that we refer to in South America. And again, you're going to see those mainly in the Amazon. So there's the Bora tribe, uh, which I actually was fortunate enough to visit in the Amazon in Iquitos, Peru. And that was just such an amazing experience and a, a little bit different to the natural healers that I'm accustomed to in Mexico, in Acapulco. So for me, it was just quite the experience and just thinking, gosh, here's a, a very similar uh, culture and we're, we're speaking a similar language, but there's still so many differences. So that's really what I want to emphasize too. It's not just this cookie 
cutter approach is this, it's, there's a variety, variety uh, of areas that you're gonna notice are different. So the last one, santeros, and that's usually what you will notice. We refer to them in the Caribbean Spanish speaking islands. Cuba, la República Dominicana, y obviamente eh, Puerto Rico, ¿sí? So that's my spiel about the curanderos, the santeros, the shamans, all the natural healers. I wanted to at least give you a glimpse of what that looks like. I do want to wrap it up by just giving you an idea of what a typical traditional Latino patient will do in terms of the process of their illness. And again, I'm not saying every single Latino is this way, but it's quite common. So let's assume I'm not feeling well. Ah, yeah, yeah, and usually it's not something that I wait a few days. It will be weeks, months until I can't take the pain anymore. That's kind of the way the Latino mindset works. We don't necessarily have that recognized concept of preventative care yet. Uh, we're getting there, but it's slowly but surely. But usually you go see your healthcare provider when you can't take the pain anymore. Once it's interfering, with your everyday life events, meaning I can't work, uh, I can't take care of the kids or my family. That's when we say I need to go seek help. So usually that said, I might have some leftover medications and antibioticos, those antibiotics, which I know you do not want us to share, but that's exactly what we're doing. If I don't have any in my household, I'm gonna call my family or my neighbor and let them know, I am not feeling well, do you have anything? And in the Latino community, the right thing to do is to share. So. Everyone is always very eager to drop by and give whatever leftover medications they have. Now, if that doesn't work, for those of us that live close to the border, as I do, I'm in Tucson, Arizona, I can just cross on over, do a little hour drive, and I go to the farmacia and I can get anything that I want there without a prescription, which I know many of you think, oh, but I'm not near the border, so that's not an issue. But yes, it is, because in many of the communities, the Latino communities in the US, we have those little mini farmacias in the back of the nail salon, the panaderia, the bread store, it could be in back of the carneceria, the meat store. So again, it's where you least expect it. So we are getting a lot of the antibioticos, a lot of the injections, the vitamin B12 ones, all of those, the herbs, the teas. So really please ask about that because we're doing that before we see you. So after that, I still might not feel well. So then I'm gonna go see my natural healers because there's that already automatic respect, the trust, the connection is already there. I don't have to explain anything. They just know it automatically. So I oftentimes as a traditional Latino, I'm gonna feel more comfortable going to see my natural healers. So usually that's happening. If I still don't feel better, then I will go and see you. However, there is one exception. And that is the babies, the kiddos. Usually with the babies and the kids, we do not wait days, weeks, months. By hour one, we are at the ER for the sniffles or any little minor thing. We don't risk it with the children. But with the adults, we really tend to wait a very, very long time. And that usually is a very common process. Or we might be seeing you simultaneously with the curandero or the santero. And I know many of you might wonder, are there natural healers in the US? In the Latino communities, absolutely yes, 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 yes. Even in your smallest Latino community, even if in your small town, if there is a Latino community, guarantee there is one of these natural healers. The thing is, we just don't announce it and advertise it. It's definitely word of mouth. So on that note, if you ever want to ask your Latino patient about that, again, I would encourage getting that trust going first, building that rapport, and then just asking in a really nonchalant way, you know, have you seen any other healthcare provider, curandero, specialist, yerbero? So blend us in together as though we're all on the same team. And then that way it signals to us, look, I'm not judging, I'm not, you know, saying anything. I'm I just would love to know and love to help. So again, I think it really matters how you deliver that message, how you ask the question. Uh, but once we know that you're interested and you're curious and there's not going to be any judgment or criticism, then we are happy and eager to share that with you. So I thank you so much for joining in on today's session. I welcome any questions. I would love to, to answer any questions that you have. And as you guys are thinking of them, just once again, I would like to thank you so much for everything that you're doing for your Latino patient uh, population. Muchas, muchas gracias. Dr. Rios, thank you so much for such an excellent and interesting talk and so important to understand where patients are coming from um, and to meet them where they're at. 
uh, you know, to give honor and respect to their traditions, but to be able to incorporate what the provider, you know, needs to do for them now that they're in the clinic. So thank you. Um, I will have you um, stop your share so they can see your beautiful face during the questions. And I wanted to let everybody know um, to remind you that you'll receive a link to the um, uh, the recording for this session, as well as the slides next week. So we'll get that out to you. And also you can always check on our Maven Project website. That's www.mavenproject.org. Um, you can find our YouTube channel um, and see our, the recordings there as well. Uh, so let's get to some of those great questions. Please put them in the um, Q&A icon on your Zoom, uh, your Zoom toolbar. So first, many of my Latino patients um, are talking about drinking a green shake, but don't know what it has in it. Any ideas? Oh, that's an excellent question. I'm so glad that you're asking. By the way, in Spanish, that is referred to oftentimes as un jugo verde, the green juice. And you're right. Oftentimes, we just don't know. And then that kind of goes to showing how, again, remember, asking questions is considered rude and questioning someone's credibility. Well, what did you put in my shake? So many times, we just don't know. We accept it. But I will say this. Nopales is a very common, uh, this is like a cactus, very, very common vegetable that we, uh, many of us Latinos will eat in terms of just having a vegetable that's healthy, that's going to help us feel better and get better from whatever it is that we're uh, dealing with. So usually my guess is it's going to be the nopal, the nopalito, also known as that. We do also use the, the green, the cucumbers. So I honestly think that it's just going to be any of the greens that we have, even spinach, because that is also taking off in Latin America, right? Those uh, juices and veggie drinks. Uh, but it Definite nopales, nopalitos. Thank you. Is it appropriate to ask what the Curandero has provided and done to date to assist? Yes, thank you. What a good question. And absolutely, I think it's important to know. And I think the a good way to really uh, get a truthful answer is all about how you ask the question and how you kind of present that. So I think a good way to do that would be to say, oh, that's excellent. You know, I'm so glad that you're taking the initiative to get the care and you're trying all of these options. That's wonderful. You actually went to go see the curandero. So tell me about that. What did the curandero say or do? I know he's quite the, the expert, you know, in your in your community, in your culture. I'd love to learn more about it. So what, what was it exactly that he or she she did or said or gave and then that way with that upbeat tone of voice enthusiasm the curiosity it really will encourage us to share with you great thank you um and there's a comment that's in the chat i do not speak spanish however our hispanic patients come to me often with questions would it be okay to ask them questions about the medical cultural options they are trying um and let's see uh sorry just there <laughs> there's a there's a little it says this presentation yeah anyway so that was the that was the question would it be okay to ask some questions on medical cultural options they're trying yes i think it's definitely worth asking about that absolutely yes and again pretty much the same answer i gave with the other one to show that interest you know the warmth i would really love to hear a little bit more about that can, can you share and you might want to ask very specific questions. For example, well, what is, or what, because if you kind of leave it open-ended, we might not go into too much detail, depending where we're from, right? The more indigenous reserve Latino might not get into too much, but you might want to make it very, you know, specific for those of us colorful, expressive Latinos that are going to go circular on you. So I would definitely encourage asking, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, and any other questions people have, you can just quickly put them in the chat or in the Zoom Q and A um, icon, or if you want to raise your hand, and we are happy to um, unmute you and have you ask the question. Um, and just while you're talking, I'm just going to share a slide that shows the um, upcoming um, sessions through Direct Relief. And so we have one tomorrow: Time Management and Preventing Burnout. That's at 10 a.m. Pacific time. It's with Dr. Fred Kleinsinger. And then Friday, September 2nd, um, psoriasis through the Vaseline Healing Project. And then in October, the Pharmacological Treatment of Anxiety Disorders. Let me check in the Q&A here. 
Um, great. Um, my questions, any suggestions on how not to generalize the natural healers, shamans, and caranderos? That's a really good question. And, and that can be quite challenging because of the 20 Spanish speaking countries, right? Plus Puerto Rico Commonwealth. So I think a good way of just uh, would be asking truthfully and just asking, you know, I know there's so many wonderful, amazing natural healers and forgive my ignorance, but tell me more, what, what is it you know? And then you can take that approach because you're right. There's so many, and again, it would be totally unfair to generalize. And again, even in one country, you'll find those variations. And on that note, I just also want to point out, remember, not all of your Latinos are going to see the natural healers or believe in this. Uh, so there, there's also going to be a percentage that actually will say, absolutely, oh no, I don't believe in that. Or, you know, it's not something that I, uh, at all see or do. So keep that in mind as well. Great, wonderful. Dr. Rios, thank you so much again. We love having you here. Uh, it's fantastic. We love learning with you. Um, and again, as Dr. Rios said, uh, to all of the providers in the clinics all across the United States, thank you so much for taking care of your patients. Thank you for wanting to learn and educate and become um, a better um, clinician in being able to interact with your patients. So we hope that you all have a great rest of your week. We look forward to seeing you at further direct relief education sessions. Um, and thank you very much.